been a very warm welcome to you all from around the world, from my habitat down in the southwest of France, uh, where I have to admit <clears throat> we've had an extraordinarily beautiful day today, 20 degrees outside, so it can't be bad in for February. Anyway, it's a real pleasure this evening that we've got Professor Paul Gilbert with us. Some of you might remember that he's presented on a couple of occasions, um, one in Winchester at, at, at our Body and Beyond, or Beyond the Brain Conference. That was quite some time ago with Ian McGilchrist and Karen Armstrong. And, and his, his presentations are, are often used by MSc students as a basis for um, researching into compassion further. Um, so uh, this evening, and as you will have seen from the title, uh, he's going to be talking about um, the challenge of creating a compassionate world and, and how we address conflicts between sharing and caring versus controlling and holding behavioral strategies. And you, you'll see that Paul is Professor of Clinical Psychology at the University of Derby and has an appointment at the University of Queensland. He used to be in the NHS for 40 years, and he uh, is the founder of the Compassionate Mind Foundation, and we'll put that link into the recording. It's compassionatemind.co.uk. But to promote our <clears throat> well-being through the scientific understanding and application of compassion. And, and he is director of the Centre for Compassion Research and Training at Derby University, and has written many books and papers on compassion. And I also just learned, because I saw um, <clears throat> something in the background, that, that Paul has 22 guitars. And so a man with 22 guitars, um, that's really something quite special. And so I'm sure he could probably give a talk about guitars as well. Uh, but this evening, we're asking him to talk about compassion. Paul, warm welcome. And we're really looking forward to what you have to share with us. David, thank you so much for your lovely welcome. And of course, we've been chatting about these things for many years. Yes, I've got a lot of guitars because I'm trying to buy one that I can actually play. <laughs> I'm trying to work out if I get one that one I can actually play. But um, OK, so this is um, this is a great opportunity. I mean, you know, we've been living through COVID and you probably are aware that the media have been full of ideas that maybe this is a changing point, changing time. and. In humanity we begin to realize we're an interconnected species and we have to help each other a little bit more and these are all great sentiments but um, there are some also obstacles in along the way so one of the things I'm going to share with you today is some ideas about the fact that actually since agriculture really uh, we've been living in pretty mad uh, in a pretty mad way we're actually not um, we're actually a little bit crazy <laughs> So this is a, this is, a, I'm going to share this with you now. Um, this is my book that came out in 2009. Now I actually started writing this book uh, back in the 90s and then sort of got a little bit um, lost with it. And my daughter found it on my computers and she has a publishing company. She said, oh, you, you got to publish this. So a couple of years ago, we updated it and here it is. So I'm going to take you through an evolutionary process. There's quite a few slides here, I probably won't get to them all, but I just want to touch on, uh, uh, on some key themes about understanding why we live in such dark times and have for many thousands of years actually, and what we need to do to be able to address it. So the first thing is recognizing that we are an evolved species. Here we are right at the top of this tree. And the first thing really is to realize that we are all part of the life process. The flow of life has been going on for many, many, millions of years, of course, and we're all connected, we're all cousins really, and we all share DNA with each other. So the key thing is we're not a separate species, we are part of the flow of life. And of course it was this chap that helped us understand how do you move from one species to another? And it's the process of evolution, the process of, of change by gradual selection and selection occurs as we meet, or as species meet, the challenge of two things, survival, the ability to survive, but then when you survive, you also have to reproduce. There's no good in surviving if you can't reproduce, and if you can't survive, then you can't reproduce. So this is very important. Now, Darwin didn't understand or didn't know very much about how those processes work. We now know we have DNA, and DNA is basically what carries information for building bodies, minds to carry them around. Now, this audience, medical audience, will all be very familiar with this. 
But bodies are relatively short-lived, subject to disease, injury, and predation. So we, 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 in, we come into this physical form, and this physical form is quite fragile yeah, and doesn't last very long. And in our physical forms, we have the uh, mechanisms that will guide us around in the world, our motives and so forth, for us to uh, survive and reproduce. Now, along the way, we've also discovered recently that on the bladders of the genes, there are literally, literally switches, epigenetic tags, which turn genes on and off. And this can be, these are, these are influenced by our environment. Now, there are many aspects that are of our environment that can have an impact on the regulation of the gene. And this is really important because the kinds of environments that we grow up with can actually have a big impact on the degree to which we are vulnerable to stress, the degree to which we are aggressive or compassionate, that can all have an impact, that can all arise from how our environments influence our epigenetics. And epigenetics is, is very, very important because um, our epigenetic profiles may well be changing over the last few thousand years because of the environments we've been creating. Well, I'll come back to that a little later. The key thing now is that there is considerable evidence that even though we have our obvious genomes and we are a particular kind of species, obviously, that the relationships that we have with each other can have a very profound effect on our physical forms. Okay, they can influence not only our epigenetics, but they can influence the maturation of the immune system. So children growing up in stressful versus um, caring and loving environments, their immune systems can evolve differently. Cardiovascular systems can mature differently. The autonomic nervous system, the maturation of the vagal nerve can be different uh, between a stressful early life and a, and a loving uh, uh, life in early childhood. So this is really quite important, I think, that we begin to recognize that although we are gene built, uh, epigenetics means that we can be profoundly influenced by the love, care, or the lack of it um, when we are growing up. So one of the implications of this is that basically all living things just found themselves here. That's the first thing. No living thing chose to be what it is. No giraffe chose to be a giraffe or elephant chose to be an elephant. No uh, man chose to be a man, or I should say male, shouldn't I really? And no female chose to be a female. None of us listening to this um, talk right now chose to be here, chose to be the gender that we are, chose to have the color of skin that we have. None of us chose to have two arms and two legs. None of us chose to have a brain that is capable of great anxiety or anger or lust or joy or happiness or depression. We didn't choose any of that. That's all being built for us. And this is important because what it means is that it, in some sense, we are all programmed and understanding that we are all programmed, we are all being built by our genes as a survival and reproductive machine is really quite important. And we also know that, as I've just indicated, that the environments we grow up can have a very profound effect on the minds and the bodies that we've got. Because we often identify, you know, this is me or whatever. But if you think about it, if I had been kidnapped as a three day old baby into a violent drug gang and I'd had violence perpetrated against me and so on, this version of Paul Gilbert wouldn't exist now. A very different version would exist. Uh, one that's probably quite violent, possibly dead, possibly in prison. My frontal cortex would be different. My epigenetics would be different. My autonomic nervous system would be different because they would have been programmed differently in these different environments. Now, the question is to what extent would I have had a choice of my programming? Well, not very much. So we know then that the programming that we end up with, uh, we didn't really have a lot of choice over. But as we will see a little later, we are, uh, we are the only species that can actually become aware of this. No other species can do that, uh, but we can. And this ability to wake up and to start to understand the nature of our programming is really quite fundamental. And it is one of the big, one of the fundamental responsibilities of all of us collectively and individually to understand how our programs are working. How is my anger system working? How is my anxious system working? What are my values? Where do they come from? Why do I believe what I believe? Because without reflection, without having this ability to stand back, distance oneself and to, and to explore the nature of one's programming, one is basically just acting out the programs of our 
program mind. Now, the other thing that we know is that we have a brain that is full of all kinds of different motivational systems. We didn't choose them, they're built in. We have a capacity for caring and uh, being cared for. We have a capacity for competing and sexuality. These are all built in, they're biological systems that when you get a certain stimulus, certain sexual stimulus, you feel sexual. Or if somebody challenges you, you can feel competitive. If somebody's very friendly with you, you might want to cooperate with them and so on. But the key point is that these motivational systems they are what organizes your mind when they're activated they will have an impact on your attention how you think and your body and so forth so understanding what motivates you uh, obviously becomes very important because if you're motivated to be competitive and self-focused that will organize your brain your body your attention in a very different way than if you're motivated to be caring so the motivational system that you are engaged with, you can either choose it by becoming mindful and aware, or it will choose you in a sense. So you can just be, you know, if you live in a competitive environment, then you may well become quite competitive yourself. And if that's the case, those programs will organize how you think and feel. So these are all run by what we call algorithms, and algorithms are pretty simple. Most of the university are run by algorithms when you fly off to wherever you fly off to. When you go to the airport, that's all run by algorithms. The banks are all run by algorithms. And algorithms are quite simple, really. They're if A, do B. And these are, these are wired into you. So if hungry, then go and find food. And you have a system in your brain for identifying food and salivating and activating your hypothalamus. If, on the other hand, you're threatened, then your threat system will be activated. If it's a lion and prays you to run away if it's a sexual stimulus then a very different set of physiological systems will be stimulated but when it comes to the caring behavior as we'll see we do have an algorithm for caring which is pretty old it's uh, there are many many mammals that uh, show an avian species that show caring which is if the infant shows distress if there's distress then turn your attention to that distress and try and do something about it and I'm going to come to caring because I think caring is probably one of the most important algorithms in the in the living world, but there are problems with it because it's uh, only one motivation amongst many. Now, many species also form hierarchies because they're competing for resources with each other. OK, and these uh, competitive systems produce hierarchies primarily, but not only of competition but also power and aggression so for example these longhorn mountain goats <laughs> go charging at each other and males as you can see when they smell pheromones from the female that tells them it's you know there's an opportunity for breeding the rest of the time they're reasonably okay uh, and this has been going on for so long in the species that they've got these amazing thick skulls 35 millimeter skulls so they can crash into each other with these horns even um, our lovely penguins can get into rather unpleasant fights over status. So status fighting is really quite endemic as a competitive strategy in many species. And uh, it's usually to do with the toughest wins. Now, of course, it's often males that do a lot of the fighting, but females also have status hierarchies as well. And they have their own ways of suppressing, suppressing subordinates. So here we are then, we're evolved species. We belong to the flow of life. We, like all other species, we have the capacity for competing and we have a capacity for quite aggressive competition as well. And we know that when the competitive uh, um, motivational system is active, this orientates us to begin to think about ourselves in the world in a particular kind of way. Now, if it's balanced, if we're balanced in our competitiveness with, say, cooperation and friendliness, and um, we can be reasonably stable, but in neoliberal societies in particular, what we now know is that the competitive motivational system is way out of control. And um, there's been quite a lot of work with children and um, young people to show that they're very, very 
uh, concerned with their social position in society. They're very, they compare themselves with others. They often feel that they're not matching up. They can feel that they're failures in one way or another. We've got an epidemic of self-criticism. David was just talking to me about the increase in young lady, women's uh, mental health problems. A lot of it is being driven by the competitive mentality, particularly self-criticism, feeling of being not up to it, not good, not included. And that's the the sensitivity to what we call the downrank aspect of competitive behavior. If you not, if you don't feel you're doing so good, then you your your brain automatically starts to create anxiety and depression for you. On the other hand, we've also got individuals who go the other way. They take the uprank solution, and these are the individuals who go on to become narcissistic. And um, there are certain leaders in the world we don't mention names, of course. We <laughs> recently lost an election. We don't mention anybody. And these individuals go exactly the opposite way. They don't feel inferior. They feel superior. They, don't, they feel entitled. They're much more likely to be aggressive. They blame others. They're not self-critical at all. Um, and if things go wrong, it's always other people's fault. And you get this splitting in these rank systems. So when you get very competitive systems, you have some individuals who are becoming quite um, anxious and socially anxious and, and go that way. And then you have another group that become much more aggressive and narcissistic. So this is a, this is a problem in competitive societies. And unfortunately we are a very competitive society. So we've got these two groups of people, uh, big time. What you're wanting to do, obviously, is you're wanting to shift them out of a competitive motivational system, because as I've said, the, the motivational system organizes so much of your mind, right? So when you're in a caring system, then you're not focused on social comparison. You're not being critical. You're focused on being aware of distress and difficulty and how to help other people and indeed help yourself. You're more able to be tolerant of distress. You're more empathic. You don't need to be empathic if you're, uh, if you're in, in the competitive situation. Okay, so that's just a little bit of a, of a background to all of that stuff. So I think this is really quite important to understand then that we've got these different motivational systems which nature has given us. They're built into the brain, but the environments in which we live in can play them, can stimulate them in very unhelpful ways. So another way of thinking about this is that these different motivational systems, and there are quite a few of them, there's about five or six of them, will literally organize your mind. So, you know, if you're into a care seeking, if you're care seeking or you're seeking help from other people, or if you are a care provider, or if you are a cooperating or a competing, this will really influence how your attention, your reasoning, your imagery is all working. The big issue is to what extent can we help people recognize what motivation system is regulating them and then change, switch. Do you, are you stuck with a motivational system? If you discover that you're caught in the competitive system, feeling inferior and self-critical and so on, can you switch? Can you switch your motivational systems? And of course, compassion focused therapy says yes. <laughs> we want you to do that. Now, there are uh, two main ways in which these motivational systems are organized, and this is linked to the environments that we're in. Now, one is that when we're motivated for caring and sharing with other people, this will have a very major impact on how we go about caring for others, uh, our sense of belonging, our sense of sharing, even with our sexuality and so forth. But if we are into control and hold, this is a competitive dynamic, then it's actually what I can grab, what I can get. It's about me, 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 me. Okay. It's the psychology of narcissistic self-focus, which is what the West capitalism neoliberalism promotes you first you compete you've got to be number one um and it's you know the the messages of we will make you great we will make britain great we will make america great be careful that is a perfume poison and it's a poison because if you buy it then you're going to buy the competitive system and when you buy that then you're going to organize your mind and your brain and your body in a particular kind of way which is not always going to then facilitate caring behavior. So, <laughs> I love this Terry Pratchett. Um, there's no doubt at all that being human is very difficult and we need a number of lifetimes to master it. So one of the things I want to get across then is humans are tricky because we have a, we are full of these different motivational systems. So let me see if I can show this to you. This is a nice elaborate. We are 
thoughtful. We are thoughtless. We are kind and we are cruel. We are creative, destructive, brave, stupid. We are heroes, villains, visionary, and we are blind. We are responsible and responsible. We are all what we have done and what we will do. So we all have a duty to do the right thing. We are no different. Sorry, so great. So this is very important then that we are a, a species of very, very mixed motivations, very mixed abilities that we come built for them we didn't choose any of them we didn't choose to be violent or angry or loving or whatever but if we can become aware of what's going on in our minds what's running us what programs are running and begin to stand back distance ourselves from our programs don't identify with them become much more conscious of being conscious this gives us an opportunity to actually begin to steer our own car as it were you know we're not we're not on automatic pilot and one of the things that will help us do that is that when we actually focus on being um, um, compassionate and I explain why being compassionate will help you um, work with your mind partly because a compassionate mind is a mind which is an integrating mind now one of the things that's quite important is to see that um, caring in particular has an algorithm or set of algorithms that comes with a very specific set of physiological systems. It evolved with a whole range of systems, such as oxytocin, which is a neural hormone, the vagus nerve, which we all know is part of the autonomic nervous system, frontal cortex. These circuits were evolving to facilitate the ability to be sensitive to suffering and have be motivated to do something about it. And we know that when people show um, problems in some of these systems and they also show problems in caring behavior for example individuals who have very poor vagal tone they're not, not always terribly caring people who have issues with the frontal cortex or empathy they're not always terribly caring so it's quite important that we understand this thing now when we begin to understand the basic algorithm of compassion first algorithm of compassion it's fairly simple because if you think about any mother with her infant, be it a, a chick or a monkey or um, um, a horse or whatever, um, that mother has a, a biological program that allows her to be sensitive to the suffering and need of her infant. And then she's able to act to alleviate and prevent it. Okay, that's, that's an algorithm. If A, then B, that's the basic algorithm. And we can not only understand that basic algorithm but we can plot it in terms of its physiology and we can call that the archetypal caring um, uh, motivational system that's a that's its archetypal root really sensitivity engaging sensitivity and motivation to do something okay and all the caring um, motivations and compassion motivations are really rooted around that one that basic algorithm so here it's a very early origin. This is the beginnings of caring for here is a crocodile, for example, who see here's the cries of her infant hatchling. She picks them up into the head and carries them to the water's edge because between the nest and the water is the time when predators can get them. So this is the one thing she does for them. She protects them from predation. After that, they're on their own. They have to then look after themselves. She doesn't feed them. She doesn't take them out for Sunday lunch or buy get their mortgages sorted for them or anything like that. Uh, that's the one act that she will do. But the point about it is it's a very early brain system that's sensitive to a particular cue and then will do something for the benefit of this little hatchling. As you would go on through the evolutionary uh, story then of course mammals it becomes much more pronounced and caring behavior becomes extremely important for the maturation of the infant uh, not only is the parent now providing protection and food and so forth but also providing an environment where that infant can learn the interactions that the 
um, infant will have with its uh, parent, primarily, but not only the mother, will have a major impact on its epigenetics, a major impact on a whole range of physiological systems. And so we know then that, as we will see, compassion too, caring is multiple. There are many types, many types of behavior in caring um, in the mother-infant dyad. She has to do different things. So when we think about compassion, then we'll also see that compassion is not one thing, you know, a lot depends. As I mentioned to you briefly, um, part of what the caring system did was to help regulate the autonomic nervous system. Now, this is a bit of a long story, so I'm not going to go into it too much, but caring behavior facilitated the vagal nerve, in particular, uh, parasympathetic system and the vagal nerve, which allowed a mother and infant to come together such that the parent could regulate the infant's physiology, regulate the infant's level of arousal. Now vagus, as you know, means wandering. So your vagus nerve goes all over the body and has profound impacts on all kinds of physiological systems that allow you to calm down, um, to feel safe. Uh, vagal activity is linked to friendliness, caringness. It responds to a smiling face. It responds to a friendly voice. Whereas a hostile voice, that's your sympathetic system you <laughs> hostile voice hostile faces that activates your sympathetic nervous system whereas friendly voices friendly voice a uh, face turns and, uh, and so forth uh, activates your vagus nerve now this is very very important because we know that humans uh, particularly in the last million years perhaps a little bit longer uh, they have uh, uh, um, really developed carrying behavior big time and they were one of the, they, they, the archaeological record shows that many, many humans were surviving with quite bad injuries, broken legs and other kinds of uh, physiological uh, difficulties. And that could only, they could only have survived if others around them were caring for them. There's also, uh, Penny Speakins has also written quite substantially that in early hunter-gatherer societies, there's not much evidence that they were aggressive and violent. You know, there's often this idea that uh, early humans were aggressive and violent, but actually the archaeological record is now being revised. You know, this swings around about, so there was a paper the other day saying, oh, well, you know, we've seen hunter-gatherers as these peaceful, wonderful, but actually probably they weren't. So, but generally at the moment, the basis of the, the evidence is that pre-agriculture, pre-agriculture, humans were pretty peaceful. They lived in small uh, communities, uh, which were mutually caring, and that's shown up in many other many things. So this these ways of living together, and bonobos are a little bit the same. Bonobos are different to common chimpanzees. They don't have these male aggressive hierarchies. They're much more matriarchal, uh, matrilineal. They have a very different type of sexual uh, engagement. They use sexual behavior for um, conflict resolution, but also friendship formation as well there's not you know it's not like males trying to dominate all the women it's a very different structure indeed and the evidence is that in hunter-gatherers the sexuality was also a lot looser a lot of the guys didn't actually know who their children were but they were very invested in caring for them now um christopher bowen who's done quite a lot of work of looking at how do we move from a, 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 a basically a primate hierarchical male dominated uh, structure where you know the, generally it was the most aggressive got most of the power uh, to a much more egalitarian way of living and his point is that actually what happened was subordinates started to get together and gang up against the dominance they form coalitions they form cooperation so we talk a lot about cooperation how important it is the early forms of cooperation in humans were against those that would be harmful to uh, not the group particularly, but you know, a set of relationships. And so Christopher says, look, I made the case that humans can remain egalitarian only if they consciously suppress innate tendencies that otherwise would make for a pronounced social dominance hierarchy. In effect, it is necessary for a large power coalition, the rank and file of the band, to dominate the groups would be uh, bullies uh, for egalitarianism to prevail. Otherwise, the group will become hierarchical with marked status differences and strong leadership. Now, 
one of the things I'm going to suggest to you is what happened is this basic mechanism of suppressing aggressive dominant primarily males, grabbers, holders and controllers fell, it, it fell apart. Uh, because of the way agriculture was, that provided us with huge amounts of resources, big uh, change in group size and so on and so on, um, the ability to suppress um, dominant aggressive males, we, we, lost, the, we lost, lost it. And um, as a result of that, uh, the last five, 6,000 years, we've struggled because most of our societies have been run along aggressive hierarchical means where there's been immense suppression of downrank behavior. We've basically uh, been living in terrorist societies for thousands of years. It wasn't so long ago, for example, that you could be hung just for stealing a loaf of bread. Or I, I came from Portsmouth and there were, in Portsmouth you could, in the 16th century, so 15th, 16th century, just be picked off the streets and put into the um, Navy. Um, and then if you did something wrong, you could be made to make your own whips that would, they'd whip you to death with, keyhole and so on and so on. The torture chambers, uh, all major cities had torture chambers. Um, and even today, now, around the world, we have uh, political regimes who have uh, locking up political opponents and torturing them. So, so we have to come to terms with the fact that although we are potentially a very caring species, uh, we're not at the moment because we have don't know how to stop the bullies. Okay, that's part of the problem, and I'll come on to that in a moment. Now, another thing that was really quite important is that we also changed from being a dom um, uh, our hierarchy is being maintained through threat to being maintained through attractiveness. Now, this is important because there's a good side to it and there's not such a good side to it. So the good side to it is obviously that we don't fight with each other to win, but we do compete for status, all right? We compete to be attractive. It's not just physical attractiveness, although that so it occurs, but we want to be talented, we want to be chosen, we want to be chosen because we pass our exams or, or we want to be chosen for the football team or it, whatever it is. Competing for place, okay, is still pretty rife in our societies because of the structure that we have. Whereas in hunter-gatherer societies, there was very little competing for place. That was very frowned on to compete for place because everybody in egalitarian so you're equal and you're just supposed to share right you don't you, you can't take a bigger share whereas competing for um with attractiveness there is still the element that if i'm more attractive than you if i'm more talented than you i get a better place at university i get a better job i get more money now we're not aggressive but we're still competing so although competing through attractiveness is better than bashing each other on the head there's still uh, problems with it there is also the issue, of course, that people want that because, for example, if you your child has a um, brain tumor, uh, then you want your child to be um, uh, helped by the most talented doctor. You want there to have been a competition. You want the most talented doctor to, to do the operation, not the least talented, obviously. So there is this in, inherent aspect of competitiveness uh, right the way through which our societies work, even though it's competing for attractiveness. The key thing, as we will see later, is not just that, it's the, it's the resources that go with it, okay? So early humans then, hunter-gatherers, and this went off a, you know, a couple of million years maybe, um, they were very much based on caring and sharing. Sexuality was much looser, much more egalitarian. Women weren't treated as property as they are uh, much later. They have very few possessions. Uh, the um, hunter gatherers was didn't store things they had where well, they were immediate use really um status was through altruism so you know you would be um valued as a member of the community if you were sharing so if you went and had a kill you went and killed an animal or something and you gave it all away to the group that would be regarded as good and the in some hunter gatherer societies even today if somebody steals from you that's fine because you assume they needed it okay um, highly pro-social, spend a lot of time um, talking, sitting around campfires, joking, uh, and basically not, not like we do now, spend a lot of our time, uh, work, 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 work. 
the idea was the social relationships were really crucial. Now, in this environment, over the millions of years, a number of things happened to the human brain. In order for us to, well, not in order for us to, but as one of the uh, processes of feeling safe with each other and having an interest in cooperating and sharing, this is going to be facilitated by a mind that can understand other minds and is interested in other minds. And there was at least three forms of human intelligence that has been evolving over the last million or so years. One is, obviously, we became able to reason in new ways. We developed a form of intelligence that helped us understand about systems. So we worked out not to eat our seeds, but to plant our seeds, and then we'd have more next year. Okay, we worked out not to just hunt the animals, but actually go and round them up and put them, you know, <laughs> they're always there on your doorstep, aren't they, really? Uh, and, and we worked out how to solve problems such as building shelters and so on and so on. So this capacity for understanding systems is very, very important. But it's only one type of intelligence. There's another type of intelligence which is relating to more of an empathic kind of intelligence, which is the ability to have social intuition, to be able to mind read, to be aware of uh, role responsiveness. Okay, uh, this sometimes is called mentalizing or mentalization. And notice that you can be good at one and not another. You can, you know, people who win Nobel prizes, for example. Uh, might not be the most empathic of people. They might not be terribly good at empathizing. They're very bright and, and they were um, very clever, but not, they don't have social intelligence, not terribly good on the empathic side. And then we have another one, which I think is extremely interesting. And for those of you who are interested in the spiritual dimension, this is the, big, this is the biggie. Um, we developed a different type of consciousness. See, there's a whole stuff going on at the moment, as you probably know, where people are now asking the question, is the universe conscious? Is conscious a property of the universe? See, materialists say, well, no, it's to do with the product of the brain, but people are beginning, scientists are beginning to say, well, we're not so sure about that. But it's the second bit that's really interesting, to be conscious of to be conscious, to be conscious of being conscious, because this is what gives you a capacity for self-awareness. You can then have an observer mind. You can now be conscious of the contents of your mind in a way that no other animal can. And these give you what we call knowing intentionality. And knowing intentionality is a profound game changer, right? <clears throat> so we know, for example, that lions will hunt their prey. Of course, they go hunting. They intend to kill and eat. That's what they do. But not knowingly. They can't suddenly decide actually, I don't want to do this anymore. It's very cruel. I'm going to become a vegetarian. Or <laughs> I'm getting very old. I need to wake up in the mornings to do circuit training because I'm just not doing this very well. Um, they can't have that awareness of what it is they're doing so that they can change what they're doing on purpose. Okay, Humans can. And this is a fundamental capacity. But we have to use this competency because if we don't, then we just carry on. We are like, the line you know we intend to do something but we don't really question ourselves about why we're doing what we're doing could we do it differently is this a good thing to be doing and of course we know that because we have this capacity to be aware of what's going on in our minds some of the things that go on in our minds can be quite frightening to us so we have these capacities for dissociation denial and so on as far as we know uh, animals don't uh, have these they certainly show post-traumatic stress symptoms of a form that might look a bit like uh, denial or dissociation, but it is somewhat different. So these are three very, very important qualities that if you're following a spiritual dimension, then the spiritual dimension is how do we use our reasoning? How do we use our empathic capacity to connect to suffering, to be empathically tuning in to the suffering of ourselves and those around us? And how do we use knowing intentionality to do something about it? Because this is what compassion is. See, many animals will care for their young and so on and so on. But humans have this knowing intentionality, and that's what makes us capable of compassion. Without this, caring is just caring. Okay, it's, it's an automatic behavior.
okay? But this awareness, the ability to know what we're doing, to have an empathic sensitivity, and, and um, to deliberately help people on purpose is extremely important. And we can train this. We can train people to be uh, empathic. We can train people to become more mindful, to have more knowing awareness. We can train people to understand the nature of their mind. This is something which is fundamental and new. So this is extremely important. So there we go. This is how we can define compassion then, quite simply based on the maternal um, algorithm. It's a commitment, it's a sensitivity to suffering in uh, and distress and self and others, that's the A, with a commitment to try to alleviate and prevent. You need to prevent it because uh, that's otherwise, if you don't, <laughs> um, then obviously you get suffering tomorrow. So you need to feed your children, <laughs> otherwise tomorrow they starve. So you need to be taking the preventative action. And what this leads you to be aware of is that the two fundamental aspects of compassion therefore become courage and wisdom. Courage and wisdom become absolutely central. And in our view, this is often forgotten. People think, oh, compassion is about love or it's about kindness. Those are fine. I'm not, not in favor of those, but they're not central to compassion. There are many people who are saving the lives of others on COVID wards, risking their own. And tragically, tragically, many of our healthcare workers have died but they don't need to love their patients. They may not even like them if they met them. <laughs> they might even be caring for somebody who two, two weeks ago robbed them. They might even be caring for a burglar who actually robbed them. So it doesn't depend upon, you know, if you look at the dictionary of love, love is about liking, wanting to be close to, and even has an association of affection. The Buddhist concept is benevolence, which is the wish for all living things to be free of suffering. So the desire to end suffering, that's compassion. Love is something different. And I think in the West, we get these words very confused, partly because of translations from one language to another. So <clears throat> that's important. So in our model and uh, the center, the center of uh, compassion is the ability to have a courageous preparedness to go and look for, engage with, understand and work with suffering rather than turning away or dissociating or denying it. Okay, remember I said about that. And then working on the wisdom of what to do because it's often, it, you know, it's not clear what to do. So we didn't have a vaccine sitting on the shelf. We had to work it out. It took us, it didn't, didn't take me, but it took those people sometimes had to use their science. So wisdom is an incredibly important aspect of compassion. Otherwise, if you have courage with no wisdom, it's, it doesn't really help. Intention without wisdom is not particularly useful. And wisdom with no courage means it may not work. So these are very important. And then we can come to the next aspect, which is that compassion involves a, um, an affirmation, really, uh, of how you wish to live. You know, you're going to be in control of your mind. You realize that you're biologically programmed, didn't choose any of that, that you've got programs in your mind that can be really quite harmful. So you're going to have to be just a bit aware, but you're going to choose to live to be helpful, not harmful. And in the work that we're doing, we're trying, we're working with compassion in politics, for example, compassion in schools, compassion in uh, business. And we're trying to get people to adopt this motto that whatever we do, remember the behavior from the little video, um, we'll try as best we can to be helpful, not harmful, with the awareness that it's very easy to be harmful. This is going to be our motto. And we're, through no fault of our own, it's not our fault that we're harmful, not blaming anybody, but it is quite easy to be, to be harmful. So in order for us to pursue that motive, then we also need the body for it. And that's why we're gonna train the body and there are all kinds of ways in which we do that using visualizations, meditations, breathing exercises to get our vagus nerve working, to get our frontal cortex working in order that we will be able to live our lives to be helpful, not harmful, being aware that as a biological being, creator, I didn't create my, myself, but I've been created in such a way that it is actually quite easy to be harmful. So, uh, and that's the, just the flow of compassion. We can pa be compassionate to other people. They can be compassionate to us and we can be compassionate to ourselves. So it's really quite important that we understand that compassion is different things in different contexts. So for example, this 
a person here saving this person's life, they won't be in a calm mind. And, you know, people say you have to have a calm mind to be compassionate. No, no, you don't. You need, you need to have a mind that is sufficiently in control of itself that it can carry out its motive, right? So this firefighter wants to save the little girl, um, but it's probably not, um, it hasn't gone in in a sort of meditative state. I'm in a calm mind, right? It's a determined, it's a determined state. Courage and wisdom, courage and wisdom is what will help there. This person, okay? Martin Luther King, right? Uh, again, what is the what he, he, his motivation is very clearly compassionate, but the emotions and the skills that he have will be quite different to our firefighter. Okay, so I'm not going to go through that because that takes a little time. So I, I want to finish a little bit now. I'm coming to the end, don't I? Because it's getting a little long. But one of the things I want to try and suggest one of the great dangers of the human mind, and there's a spiritual question to this as well. And it's all to do with the concept of waking up and enlightenment is that if we don't if we don't wake up and start to pay attention to what's going on in our mind and how it's been created then with the brains that we've got we are also one of the most dangerous and nasty species that have ever worked this earth and that's because we really are not paying attention to the way in which we've been built and we have all kinds of biases built into our brains. For example, we're very self-focused compared to others. We're very kin-focused, okay? If you have a chance to save your own two children from a fire or five children down the road, who are you gonna save? Horrible, horrible question, but the point about it is, of course, we look after our own genes. Uh, we're a very tribal species because we lived, we evolved as small hunter-gatherer groups, so we're used to thinking tribally, right? But that tribal psychology is a terror. It does terrible things. And because of our gene biases, we will spend a fortune at Christmas on our kids and eating stuff and, or, you know, until we get, get bloated and chuck a lot of it away. Yet we know just a thousand miles away there are children who are dying. So, but so, so why don't, hang on a minute, this is, this is a bit daft. So why don't we actually make sure that before we have so much, we, we give away so that people around the world have what they need. Well, we don't because we, we don't have a brain for it. <laughs> we, we have to learn to do something different because if we let the brain do what it wants to do, the brain will focus on our own. That's what it's designed to do, okay? It's a genetic replication thing. We know that thousands, millions and millions of children are growing up like this where other people live like this. And we know also that humans are potentially very vicious. I mean, some of the ways we've invented to kill people is just horrendous. Um, our torches are horrendous. I mean, why on earth would you want to do that? And yet, during the Roman period, this was very common. I mean, you could walk out of the gates of a city and people would be dying in the most horrific ways and you wouldn't even notice them. You'd walk past them the way you walk past beggars and this homeless people in the street today. Okay, we, we, we have minds that can literally dissociate and deny suffering. Entertainment. For 700 years, gladiatorial games were a source of entertainment. Uh, tribal violence is just extraordinary. And, you know, people, when they go to war, you imagine going to, into these battles. I used to imagine when I was a young boy, I used to scare the hell out of me. What would I have been like if I'd been a Roman or, you know, and I had to go rushing at somebody with a sword and being prepared, being prepared to be speared or something like that. I mean, it's pretty, how, how on earth have we been able to do this? Not just to a few people, but 10 billions with a B, possibly trillions. We have slaughtered each other. And what's even worse is that over the last few thousand years, guess the people who've been dying. It's been the peacemakers, the farmers, the non-aggressive individuals that couldn't fight back, they're the ones that have been slaughtered in their millions. Goodness knows what we've done to our genotypes and phenotypes that came from hunter-gatherers. Goodness knows, okay? That is still to be explored. There's, in the paper I've just written, there's a really interesting study on Genghis Khan, and it's estimated that about 4% of humans have his genes because he was such a vicious rapist. Here we go. These are the horrors that we create. 
somewhere in Syria. They say, go back to your homes. Well, that's what they go back to. And we've been selling arms, haven't we? Our arms industry have been, that's what our arms industries do. We give people jobs so that they can sell arms so that we can do that. And uh, so the key thing I want to get across to you is that we have this wonderful capacity to be compassionate. We certainly do. But if we don't use it, if we don't recognize it, if we don't use our brains to wake up and become aware of what we're up to, then the other motivational systems, the tribal systems, the me first systems, the competitive systems, the I want more systems, they will run our minds and they are. And this is the great challenge, okay? The fact of the matter is that we can be very callous, we can be indifferent to suffering, and we can be very cruel, we can deliberately cause it, and if we look at our history, our history is pretty terrible, really. And we have to be, have the courage. See, this is where compassion and courage comes in. We have to have the courage to understand this, <clears throat> that humans <coughs> have a terrible dark side. We are the greatest source of suffering to humans and to animal, animals as well, you know, our factory farms and so on. We are a nightmare. So on the one hand, compassion, great. We're a wonderful species and there's all kinds of stuff, you know, want to be kind and all that stuff well be careful uh because you know don't deny the dark side because if you do that then you're going to run into trouble and our society feeds this diets of uh, fear and vengeance if you think about a lot of our entertainment now what is it it's vengeful entertainment it's all about the bad guys doing horrible things and then in comes james bond or wherever it is to do horrible things to the bad guys this is the basis of excitement, Mission Impossible, all of these things, right? Dominant males going against other dominant males. And we all go home, we think, oh, this is great. But we're being fed shit. This is not, this is exciting, yes, but what is it doing to our brains? What is all these video games doing to our brains? There are many, many concerns about the competitive, aggressive competitive behavior. And we know that, therefore, it is quite easy for really good people to do some pretty bad stuff now what i want to i want to stress this because we need to understand that it was agriculture that put us on this road it was having more i mean it's very interesting in terms of getting um, the book of genesis you know eating the apple because in reality it was literally eating the apple it was literally beginning to um farm and as a result of farming uh, we gave up our connection to the natural environment. We started to store and we started to see the rise of the aggressive male. And really, just if you think about it from the Vikings, Alexander the Great, the Roman Empires, Genghis Khan, all of these groups and societies, and still today, are being regulated by dominant aggressive males that we do not know what to do not only do we not know what to do about them but we allow ourselves to be led by the nose to support them uh to support the very psychology that is our undoing so this is what we mean when we say that you know the the, the courage of compassion is to look into the causes of suffering uh so this is where we get into these things so i'm going to go through this quite quickly now because i because I'm just aware I've gone over uh, my time a little bit. So business, right, has created a radically different world. Now business is okay, that's fantastic, but once again, it's the accumulations that's the importance of business. We've allowed accumulations of power. So business is a way of, uh, of uh, uh, making things happen that's very important and you're never gonna stop that. Entrepreneurship, very, very important. That isn't the problem. The problem has is the way that that the fruits of business fall into the hands of the few who then use it to power the dark side okay the last bit then just to come through um, to think about the challenges of the modern world we, we've got a lot of challenges that we really need to get our minds around there's the changing nature of work and the acceleration of automation you know 10 20 years jobs are disappearing. I mean, I try to pay my insurance on the phone <laughs> today because I like to talk to people, you know, my car insurance likes to talk to people. And I've always been able to just phone up and pay it with somebody and have a nice 
lady that talks me through my policy or man talks me through my policy. No, it doesn't do it anymore. It's all online. I said, what do you mean it's online? I don't want to do it online. I want to talk to somebody. No, no, I can't do it now. So my, my son works for Toyota. There's not going to be any jobs. Okay. We, we really need to be thinking about these issues. There's a the fast pace of change. And work is also a source of meaning for people, right? It's not just, we don't want to give people meaningless jobs. And although some people have been enjoying lockdown, um, others have found it a pretty isolating, lonely position. We've got the problems of um, bullying and whistleblowing. We've got all kinds of work stress that are going on. Anyway, look, I'm not going to go through this because as I say, I want to um, come back to our final points, which is to, to highlight the fact that we are, uh, we have an amazing brain. We really, really do. We have a body and a brain that is built for compassion. Uh, absolutely. But uh, we also have a terrible, terrible dark side. I mean, they had this problem millions of years ago in a far and distant galaxy when, you know, Luke Skywalker was around, you know, beware the power of the dark side. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> it's true. So all of us in compassion, really, in the compassion literature, trying to, in the compassion, are trying to work out it's not just about spreading, you know, let's teach people to be compassionate. We have the problem of how do we work with the dark side, okay? Because if we don't, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. We have this power to be on the red side, uh, but we also have the potential to be on the green. And that's where a lot of the science has to help us, uh, particularly in our politics, particularly in our business, particularly in our entertainment, particularly in our media. Uh, um, that our media love the dark side, <laughs> just too. So when you look at hunter-gatherer societies, last slide's coming up now, you can see that basically in hunter-gatherer societies, they, they were primarily uh, egalitarian. There was an inhibition of strong competitiveness, uh, support and respectfulness. There was a suppression of narcissism, group parenting. There's a whole... Uh, area of research now showing that children work best in community-based caring systems not being totally reliant on a parent particularly in a home so that you know they've got aunts and uncles around them and uh, uh, other people in the group and they can you know peer groups that will be supportive to them they're looked after by a number of different people um, I mean in our, in our schools now you can't even cuddle a child if they're distressed because you get accused of pedophilia or something this is madness we are we are a tactile species okay if you if you look at hunter gatherers they're constantly in physical contact with other often the mother but not always and then you look at the red side and this is what we've become we've become hierarchical we heighten competitiveness we allow exploitation we have limitations on empathy we reward and promote narcissistic self-promotion um limited parenting i mean many of the the problems that we have with some of our leaders you can see they're all seeded in childhood of aggressive neglectful childhoods these individuals have these neglectful childhoods i mean you look at trump he had a terrible childhood right they're dangerous <laughs> look at some of james gilligan's stuff right dangerous politicians okay these are really quite important so we need to begin to think about childcare. We need to begin to get into the schools. We need to work in politics. We work, I work with a group called Compassion in Politics. One of the things that Compassion in Politics is trying to do is to get politicians to agree not to pass legislation that knowingly is harmful to the less able to defend themselves. When we had uh, uh, austerity, David Cameron's austerity, it was severely criticized by the uh, United Nations because it did so much damage to the poor. And you, what happens is you get politicians who say, oh, we have to have tough decisions. I don't mind tough decisions, but they're not. They're callous decisions. Callousness is, is, is sold as toughness. Tough decisions would be um, taxing the rich. Uh, it's been estimated, you've probably seen this in the papers, that the top 10% wealth of people have made so much money out of or during this pandemic that they could pay for the pandemic. Okay. It's just, but there's no 
evidence that politicians are going to go after them for a sizable amount of money, they're going to start taxing uh, all of us in one way or another. Yeah, it's not good, is it really? So we, we need to be much more aware about how we create compassionate societies, how we live to be helpful, how we take responsibility in our schools, in our businesses, in our politics. We're working with businesses, we're working with shareholders, for example. Shareholders, okay, you, you want to invest in a company, that's okay. But do you know what your company is doing? Okay. Is your company working to be helpful? Are you investing in weaponry? Are you investing in fossil fuels? Are you investing in plastics? Because the moment people stop doing that, that's the end of the game. So it is all of our responsibilities really to become aware of the ways in which we are living to be unhelpful because we are not taking responsibility for our actions. So this is the last slide then. Correctly understood, compassion is not about kindness, particularly love particularly, but compassion is the most courageous because it does take courage to, to work against the dark side and the wise of all of our motivational systems. It really is. In order to address the serious dark side of the human mind, then we need to begin to address compassion in our schools, because at the moment our schools are totally focused on competitiveness. It's all oh, you've got to do this, you've got to jump through these hoops and so on. There's been some brilliant research done showing that our children are becoming overburdened with the sense that if they're not able to achieve, then they're no good. You know, this sense of if I, I'm either something or I'm nothing. So there we are. There's a few books for you. Living like crazy. We are living like crazy. We are living. We have created a world with a lot of comforts. I like some of my comforts. So they're pretty nice. Uh, but also a world which is really very, very damaging to the human mind. It doesn't really fit the human mind. The human mind works best when we feel part of a community, caring, loving community, and we feel we can make a contribution. And that's the most important thing now. That's the most important thing is we create a world where people feel they can contribute. Not that you look after them, they feel they can contribute. And this is where a lot of individuals are feeling excluded by society. When I worked with elderly people in homes, uh, some of their depression was very much around the idea that, well, you know, my family's moved away now, who needs me? When I worked with depressed young people who are unemployed, who needs me? What have I got to contribute? Nobody needs me. Who needs me? Where do I fit in? What? There's no sense of being a part of something, right? It's all about compete, compete, compete. But we need to create a society where we all feel we can contribute. We are part of this. Okay, when it comes to our, our um, uh, climate change, we can contribute. And I'll give you one example, because it drives me mad, these examples. You've probably seen in the press you know, all these pictures of people with COVID masks looking out as it, you know, and it says, you know, as if they're dying, tell this person that you're not isolating or tell this person you're not wearing a mask. And you think to yourself, where on earth are these people getting the science from? We know that if you do that, if you show those kinds of things, you turn people off, right? All of the work that was done on, you know, starvation, showing children with pot bellies and everything, it turned people off. Don't do that, right? What you can do is you show somebody like an elderly person gardening who says, thank you so much for your sacrifice that has allowed me to live and to do this. Thank you so much for your sacrifice because now I can live and look after my garden. Now I can be with my grandchildren. See, the message is totally different. Trying to make people feel bad, it's just nuts. Trying to make people feel valued. We are grateful for your contribution. It's a very different psychology. So, shut up now. <laughs> the point about it is, when we understand compassion, we understand this importance that we all want to be compassionate if we're given an opportunity. And I believe that is the great challenge to get an opportunity to be compassionate and to be careful about how we deal with competitiveness. So I'm going to stop because <laughs> I'll just carry on. Thank you very much, David, for inviting me. And um, I'll leave it there. Paul, thank you very much indeed.
Uh, that was really a tour de force, um, you know, taking us through these these evolutionary algorithms. Perhaps you could stop sharing your screen. That would be good. And the the effectively the the human operating system. We don't actually learn about our own operating systems in the way that you've explained this evening. And so that this this strikes me as sort of core curriculum stuff and um, also applies to relationships and, and all sorts of other areas. But the, what, what, what you've been talking about um, is enables us to understand ourselves and to become conscious of being conscious and conscious of our, our motivations and, and, our, and develop knowing intentionality. Let's go on to questions for Paul. Um, a very inspiring and necessary message, um, I think, that Paul has shared with us this evening with his w wisdom and courage uh, as these important parts of co compassion, the, the state of the world, um, how, do we, how, how, how can we actually navigate the future uh, given the human operating system. So Tuvi, you were first in line, so over to you. First of all, thank you very much for an uh, excellent presentation. And uh, I like both the concept and I, uh, I heard in the past, which I like very much this concept. But I've got also an, um, uh, one, I think, important question. The uh, 90 people or more that listen to you now from the SMN, etc. I believe that uh, most of them, or if not 100% of us, agree with you. It's not a question. And what you call, you are preaching to the choir that already agree with this, as you can see, David, already organized many, many conferences, very similar. Even you, of course, you, you explained something very, very nice, etc. My question is, how you convince, not the people here who agree, but about 70 millions who, who vote for Trump and the leaders like Putin, etc., which are not exactly uh, going exactly in these directions and influence so many millions of billions. So, because it, uh, it will be very nice if many of us will be there, but what happens if 70 million continue uh, to listen to people like uh, Trump in America and, uh, and Putin, etc. So how you can change the humanity uh, with these people, not just with the nice people who, who enjoy to read your books and listen to you? That's my question. I think it's a terrific question. It's a fantastic question. And of course, it is the $64 million question, right? I think more, more than $64 million would not be enough. <laughs> yes. yes, no, it's a big one. Um, <clears throat> so I think you can chip away at it. So you have to target. So the first thing we're doing is targeting. I mean, David mentioned this, targeting schools so that people begin to understand some of these issues. The second thing is <clears throat> we have to understand much better the reasons that people will vote for the Trumps of this world, that I will make you great and everything, and that it's all fear-based, isn't it? You know, of course. We, and so the, que the question that we have to ask is, how can we address people's fears? Because telling them not to do it, or they're stupid, or something like that, that only drives them into that camp even more. So the, those of us who are interested in the, the politics of compassion, we need to begin to understand how we help people feel that they can make a contribution in a different way. And I think this is where I, I don't think left and right are very useful anymore, but it's, it's not really about people thinking, you know, I've got to look after my own. It is really about, um, I'm wanted, I, I'm, I'm wanted. <laughs> um, what I do matters. And there's a lot of issues now where people feel what I do doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter what I do. So we've got a lot of issues to do. We've got a lot of work to do in terms of basic education, as David was saying. People don't know a lot of this stuff. We've got to work in the schools. We've got to work with politics. There are actually in um, um, the Compassion and Politics group, behind the scenes, there are actually quite a lot of politicians who are genuinely interested in, in being helpful. You know, Joan Cox, who was murdered. I mean, she was a good woman. You know, so we must understand that how do we coordinate the, those individuals who do have these um, desires? I mean, there are people who don't, 
but how do we work with those? That's the first thing to, to do, to bring those individuals that share these values together to work together, because at the moment they're very desperate. Dis disparate. Um, working with businesses, there is a gradual movement in businesses now. I don't know if you heard Mark Carney's Reith lecture um, talk about uh, the new economics needs to be focused on human values, not financial values. So there's all of these bubbling things around, which I find extremely exciting. What we need to do is start to coordinate this now, because I think there's lots of people who realize that we can't go on the way we are, you know. Uh, we need to create a much more integrated world. We need to create a world that is fairer. We need to create a world that actually serves our sense of making, being part of it. Otherwise, if people just feel they're not part of it, that's that's when we get into trouble. So I think it's a wonderful, wonderful question, but there's no one answer to it. It's all these different efforts that are going on in different ways in different parts, how we can coordinate them and how we can value them and how we can let people know that they are going on. Because I personally think that there's also quite a lot of reason for hope, <coughs> but it's, it's sort of little twinkles around here in, in different places. Well, thank you very much, Paul. I mean, there is a huge movement or you know, quite a large movement and online events, something called Humanity Rising. I don't know whether you've come across that. No. And there are 400 organizations which are part of that. And, and we, we've also been taking part um, in, on, in some of their programs. And I, I also want to mention that the, in the school's work I do called Inspiring Purpose, one of the questions I ask um, young people is not only what do you want to achieve, but what do you want to contribute in your life? Yeah, that's right. And this contribution and values is just critical. Uh, Marilyn, um, you're next. Um, you just need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. I mean, I think a lot about these things. I'm very interested in the rules of evolution. And I think that one needs to look very carefully at three, the very important concepts, belonging, meaning, and purpose. And also the nature of boundaries. In evolution in terms of belonging meaning and purpose in my sort of hierarchy from atom to cosmos everything belongs and serves its higher order structure whether that be an electron to an atom or a, a cell to a tissue or a solar system to a, to a, uh, to a galaxy um, and everything has belonging meaning and purpose in service throughout evolution that's how I see it works. Uh, and in some ways, I mean, our generation was called the lucky generation. I was always being told that the world was my oyster, although I never actually got it, um, what was so good about my world being an oyster. But um, we, I mean, the whole thing, we distinguished family, we called it family of origin, because the connection with um, parents and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins and everything, well, in my case, got really lost. You know, the world was our oyster and we spread out and left and, 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 and lost our connection in that way. And then about boundaries, I mean, you've talked about this. I mean, the problem with warring fractions is overlapping boundaries in all species in evolution. If they outbreed their resources and they make too many there's too many of them. I mean, koala bears in Australia are doing this all the time. They're, then there's too many of them and they eat all the good gum leaves and, and they start overlapping with other koala communities within the boundary, as you said. You've got altruism, you've got division of labor, you've got service, you've got sacrifice, you've got everybody, everything within the boundary, whether it be koalas or people working for survival of that tribe, herd, pride or community. And between the boundaries, you have the seven deadly sins. And that's why boundaries are protected. And when they overlap, there's trouble. Now, I, I just think in terms of boundaries, what, what's happened with humans is that we've crisscrossed the planet with boundaries. Everywhere, you know. <laughs> and uh, and all, 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 the, all the warring and killing is happening when, with the overlapping between the boundaries. Uh, and, and, and not only did we crisscross the planet with boundaries geographically, but there's religious boundaries that are not 
now isolated in different countries. There's um, race boundaries. There's football teams which you support boundary. There's there's Brexit and Remain boundaries and Trump Biden boundaries and so there is a rule in evolution um, that within the boundaries all that is good belonging meaning and purpose within a boundary uh, is a, a very important survival selectable in evolution and definitely between boundaries and as I say it doesn't matter if you're a koala or, or a human being there's, there's your seven deadly sins so I, I mean, I, I think I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just presenting problems. I don't know. No, how. no. I mean, very, very interesting. And I think this, well, your exposition on boundaries is, is absolutely central and, and very important. Do you also have a question, or was it really more of a comment? No, it, it's a question. I mean, I can only see that. How to deal with boundaries? In a way, I suppose my answer to myself: the only way we'll come together as human beings if we were attacked by some aliens from another planet, and then our our human boundary, our you know, will pull us together in opposition to these aliens from somewhere else. Well, Paul, what do you what do you think of all that, and and, and how do you see boundaries? Well. Yes, I mean, <clears throat> it's very, very interesting. I mean, a lot of boundaries are based to what we call tribalism. And we're often trying to get back to the uh, relatively small groups that we can identify with, that we can share values with, with it, be it a football team or a political or, or spiritual or whatever it is. So the sense of belonging to, to, to a group or to a tribe is extremely important. Um, the problem comes when that group then thinks that it's special in some way and is entitled <laughs> to take over other groups or conquer the world or invade another, whatever. It, it, that, that's the problem with boundaries. It's when it's actually, you value your group, that's fine, you, great. But then when you actually think that you're better than others, it's that competitive aspect within tribalism that causes a lot of trouble. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to take uh, Mirabai Swingler's to, um, question in the chat here. The mental <coughs> health system, the system that's supposed to be caring, is full of bullies, aggression, and power over. It's all about control and hold. How do, you, how do the vulnerable within such a hierarchical and bureaucratic system create a power coalition to transform this situation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if you work it out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful question. So that is a oh, these are very very important questions, and this is what we mean by compassionate wisdom, because it's not on the shelf. See, we're not yeah. sure. Yeah. We're not quite sure how to do this, but we're not going to solve the problem unless we start asking the questions. So the question is a very very important one, and you know there are tentative um, pointers to things like knowledge sharing, people being aware, people being connected, people having opportunities to come together, to form alliances against bullies. That's the first thing. Um, whereas if people don't have those opportunities, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that one of the first things that has happened in Burma is they've stopped the internet, they've stopped people connecting because they know that's a problem. You don't want people connecting because if they connect, then they can form gangs against you. So facilitating people to connect with an interest to um, work against the bullies, that's, that's the first thing. How do you bring people together? And the second thing is how do you give them courage? Because sometimes that does take an awful lot of courage, you know? And of many of us, including myself, think, well, maybe it would be better just to stay at home rather than risk, you know, taking on the police or something. So there, there are lots of little pointers, but I think interconnectedness is the first thing. How, how we get groups to interconnect, to then work for the common good or whatever the, the value is. Thank you. Yes, I mean, these are, these are all work in progress, as it were. But as you say, if you don't ask the questions, then you don't get action that might be related to those questions. Yes, that's right. Um, Bernard, uh, Bernard is our president, who's an astrophysicist, um, Paul. Um, Paul, thank you very much. I'd like to ask you a, a, historical, a historical question. I mean, when one looks at the history of civilization, one sees this, I suppose, constant 
battle between the the compassionate side and the dark side. Yeah. And and one does really rather get the impression, I'm not a historian, but you one gets the impression that, that by and large, the dark side has won. <laughs> Although obviously you've got the dark uh-huh. side as well. And so I wanted to ask you from a historical perspective, um, is that is that correct that in some sense the, the dark side tends to win? And are there what are the reasons for optimism that the situation may be now different or different in the future? And a related question is is um, the role of religion from a historical perspective? Because you might like to think that religion, in some sense, was a sort of com- of compassion. And yet, historically, again, it's often brought far the opposite, you know, um, lots of uh, bloodshed and horrors as well. So I I would just like to have your historical perspective, both in the role of about the role of religion and indeed civilization as a whole. Well, it's great. So there are two things, really. The first thing is, I mean, I'm not in any way a religious scholar, but religion primarily um, began because of, we become conscious of being conscious. So we became aware that we could suffer and we could die. So that was the first question. I could, so what's that about then? And um, <clears throat> what about all these famines and droughts and why are they happening and other deities that can control them? So if you look at a lot of the early religions, they're all really about having deities that can control things and help you do things. And some of the, some of the religions, um, required quite a lot of appeasing behavior, like the Aztec religions, the Zunu guards, for example, who uh, wanted you to kill your children or that, sacrifice a few virgins, all that sort of stuff. And the concept of sacrificing to gods and all of that. So I think that religions have been born out of uh, this coming into awareness of awareness, coming into the awareness that we exist for such a short time, everything we love and so on will pass away which was the Buddhist big issue about suffering, that everything is impermanent, everything is in flux. So whereas the Buddha sought to explore that in terms of understanding the nature of the mind, religion sought to explore that in terms of, well, there must be somebody in control. I've just got to find out who it is. And if I can can do things that that would please them, then maybe I'll be okay. So the God of the Old Testament is a bit of a psychopath, really. Mm. So if you misbehave him, you get turned into a pillar of salt or you get drowned or something like that. But the archetype changes, doesn't it? This gradually changes. And so, you know, the God of the Old Testament, it gives way to a God of love and that sort of thing. Um, but I think what's gradually emerging now is that your field, science, is beginning to say, well, we actually can have a spirituality without necessarily having deity. We can have a spirituality which is maybe about the whole nature of the universe. We are part of that. And so it's not really a separation of some creator up there, but we're all part of this extraordinary, whatever it is that's going on. So I, I think that this, the spiritual um, wave is intensifying because of science. I think science mm-hmm. is actually generating uh, a, a profound questioning about what is this place? What is time? You know, there's some really interesting stuff suggesting that actually the human brain creates time and space, that actually it's all a bit of a, an illusion. So I think that's really very interesting. Now, are, is the dark side winning um, up until recently? Well, I think if you look at it now, um, we don't have slavery. like we, There is still slaves, unfortunately, but not like there was. Um, our sexual freedoms are more. Um, I think most people would prefer to be living now than three or four hundred years ago. Mm. I certainly would prefer to be living now than in the Roman times. So I'm certainly not a Roman slave. Um, so something has happened to the human mind that we really wouldn't live like the Romans. We wouldn't have slaves that you can just beat and rape whenever you want. They, they thought that was perfectly okay. Nothing wrong with that. We don't think that now. Um, we don't think it's okay just to spend the afternoon watching people being slaughtered and butchered, uh, <laughs> maybe on the television, but not for real. So mm-hmm. something is happening to the nature of the human mind slowly, slowly, slowly. We don't have our torture chambers anymore. We don't go and watch people getting hung, drawn, quartered anymore. Um, there's still <laughs> elements of this that people want to see that on Game of Thrones. Like, so it is changing. And I think we are gradually emerging out of the dark side. But up until 
fairly recently the dark side was very very powerful could, could yeah. i put your could i put your two answers together to say mm -hmm. that possibly mm -hmm. the scientific spiritual development will be enough to override the previous yes. historical trend yes yes that is my hope mm -hmm. and um, we're doing some very interesting work in psychedelics looking at psychedelics and the kinds of experiences people have now we don't know how real they are they may just be chemical tricks or whatever it is but it's certainly the case that when people get an experience of intense connectedness something happens <clears throat> it changes them fundamentally mm -hmm. and they're not changed because of the change of the neurochemistry mm -hmm. they're changed by the experience the, the phytocybin and that sort of thing so you know and as you probably know there's some very interesting work going on and people who are very frightened of dying cancer patients and these drugs are now being used to take away their fear of death so there's something about when we experience a deep sense of connectedness that somehow that does something to our fear mm -hmm. um, Anyway, that's cool. yeah. I think that's right, and I think Aldous Huxley sort of realised that um, yeah. in Ireland and and some of it, you know towards the end of his life. And I I, I remember uh, Bernard, you organised this meeting in Cambridge on the multiverse, and Keith Ward was one of the speakers. Yes. And somebody said to him, uh, "Well, don't you think religion is dangerous?" And he said, "No, it's not religion that's dangerous. It's humans who are dangerous." Yes. <laughs> uh, and I think that's what you've been saying this evening, Paul. And I'm just going to end um, because uh, Ma Marilyn mentioned uh, Jonathan Sachs um, in the uh, in the chat. There's been a memorial service for him um, today, and I I found this very striking passage. Some of you may have read it in my Towards a New Renaissance editorial, where he gave um, the, he said the following when he received the Templeton Prize in 2016. He said, "You can't outsource conscience." You can't delegate moral responsibility away. When you do, you raise expectations that cannot be met. And when inevitably they are not met, society becomes freighted with disappointment, anger, fear, resentment, and blame. People start taking refuge in magical thinking, which today takes one of four forms, the far right, the far left, religious extremism, and aggressive secularism. The far right seeks a return to a golden past that never was. The far left seeks a utopian future that will never be. Religious extremists believe you can bring salvation by terror. Aggressive secularists believe that if you get rid of religion, there will be peace. These are all fantasies, and pursuing them will endanger the very foundations of freedom. And he goes on, if we continue to forget that a free society is a moral achievement that depends on habits of responsibility and restraint, then what will come next will be neither liberal nor democratic and it certainly will not be free. And so he proposes that we need to restate the moral and spiritual dimensions in the language of the 21st century in ways that are uniting rather than divisive. And so I then say, well, this is our challenge to affirm our common humanity. And I think that's what you've, you've done for us um, tonight. And in all its complexity, you, 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 you haven't shied away from uh, showing us the, the evolution, the, the negative evolutionary, the shadow of evolutionary pattern, uh, patterns that we need to, to look at and address at every level. And, and so it's, it's been um, hugely rich and, and illuminating. And I think all of us um, have something to go away and think about in our own lives and relationships. Uh, and also to, as you suggested, to, to cultivate courage and wisdom. Um, as well as compassion or compassion through courage and wisdom. The, these are the sorts of encouragement that we need. Tuvi, you've got a PS. We don't normally take an extra question or observation at this time. Uh, is it short? Yes, very short, because I start with the challenging questions, okay? I want to finish with optimism, okay? I believe there is answer to these questions. And part of it is instead of fighting what you call zero, uh, one zero game that you know that you have to see we're taking bigger part of the cake if we collaborate together we can show that each one of us will have more and there is enough resources if we collaborate together so in this case if i'll take the the people who support trump the way to tell him is not just a compassion will be good for others but if we, all of us will be compassion will be good for each one including to them they have a better life so this is the way to convince everyone that we've got common if you we'll work on this, it will be good for each one of us, and not just for others. This is a common thing that, uh, that I believe. 
Thank think, you yeah, very much. Yeah, I mean, one of the we talked a lot about the consciousness of consciousness, but the second one is empathy, right? So we do empathy training, and so it, what I try to suggest is, you know, if I'd been brought up in a violent drug gang, then that that would be me, right? So we we there, there's no separation from me and the criminal. So when I do empathy training, just imagine what it would be like to be Trump. Get into his mind, imagine what he feels, imagine his anger, imagine his rage, his, imagine his desperation to make America great. It has to be important. People have to love him. They have to love him. They've got to, they've got to. to get into that mind, you know. If you're a man, imagine what it's like to be a woman, you know. If you're thinking about the problems of slavery, don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed of slavery, but just imagine what that would have been like. What would it have been like to have been picked up seeing your wife thrown overboard what would see if we get empathically connected then we can begin to understand these different patterns that can exist in the consciousness this is the ground of all consciousness you can move into any pattern within consciousness and start to understand it and you can realize that actually these are all different patterns at any one time i could i could be in that pattern i'm not i'm in this pattern <laughs> but by our capacity for empathy is a spiritual gift we can move into the minds of others by just allowing ourselves to be. And that is where the courage comes because then you can move into the mind of the sinner. You can move into the, there's a wonderful poem. You probably know this by Thich Nhat Hanh called Call Me By My True Names. Do you know, you know that poem? So, you know, the, the, the ability to use consciousness of consciousness, the ability to really hone our empathy, to be able to move into the, to be empathic to the dark side as well as the good side. And I've just finished on a lovely little story, which is a Zen story. There are two waves rushing across the Pacific, a big wave and a little wave. And they've been going for quite a few months. And then the big wave says to the little wave, oh, I think we're about to arrive in California and it's finished. Uh, there's all, you know, there's rocks ahead, there's foam everywhere. We are done for. We're, this is the end of it. It's terrible. And the little wave says, don't worry, it's all fine. And the big wave says, no, no, it's awful we're all going to be turned to foam i can see it's coming now and the little wave says well actually you're not a wave you're water <laughs> <laughs> brilliant <laughs> well what a lovely note to end on paul and and uh, i i think we've had such an interesting evening we, we'll we'll have to uh, have a sequel to this to uh, delve a bit deeper into into the sort of actions that we can take but uh, thank you for all your work uh, for your contribution uh, this evening uh, and uh, the way that you uh, engaged warmly with us so, uh, uh, good night everyone thanks so much for coming <laughs>